Deadly and dangerous storms in the west sparking devastating flooding and rock slides, sending boulders rolling onto highways. Tens of millions are under watches tonight. Our senior meteorologist, Ron Marciano, is tracking it all from the storm zone. Classified documents discovered at the Penn Biden Center in Washington, D.C. What's in them? How many were found? And where? And what does this mean for the president as the Republican-led House kicks off its own investigation? Cross-country journeys in the hopes of sanctuary. Tonight, we follow along on a migrant's dangerous and long trek to the border, step by step. Do not just show up at the border. Stay where you are and apply legally from there. And quirky and quick with an unusual approach to crime solving, the best-selling series Will Trent comes to life on screen. I talk with Ramon Rodriguez about his starring role and how he prepared for it. The character for me, Will, I mean, as I got to just learn more about him and read about him, I think, you know, his resilience, uh, someone that has gone through a lot in life and, and is able to persevere, that was something that I definitely connected with and, and responded to with the character. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us tonight. We are tracking several headlines developing in the U.S. and Mexico, where the president wrapped up a news conference. He gave his first extensive comments on the issue now swirling around his administration, his handling of those classified documents found in his former private office from his time as vice president. We have Mary Bruce standing by from Mexico City. But first, the relentless parade of cyclones pounding the west and beyond. Once again, California is right in the bullseye tonight. Since Christmas, parts of the state have received as much as 36 inches of rain. Tonight, there are additional evacuations, and officials describe the conditions as dangerous and deadly. And this wet weather is really taking a toll in Venture County. Roads are collapsing in Fresno County. A rock slide sent boulders crashing down the hillside onto Highway 168. In the city of Santa Barbara, creeks have overflowed. More than 100 vehicles are underwater. And of course, there's major flooding. Parts of this neighborhood in Merced County are underwater. And these storms are also giving ski resorts in the Sierra Nevada a winter to remember. Mammoth Mountain near Yosemite has already passed last year's snowfall for the entire season. 35 feet and counting at the summit. And as this powerful storm is striking tonight, at least another week's worth of systems are already lined up right behind it. Our senior meteorologist Rob Marciano will have the track in a moment, but first, he has more on the damage already done. Tonight, those relentless rains liquefying Southern California hillsides. I heard a big thunderous roar. My dogs went crazy. In the Hollywood Hills, mud and debris inundating this Studio City neighborhood. Families in the area forced to shelter in place. In Central California, highway patrol officers blocking traffic as massive boulders rain down on Highway 168 in Fresno County as the storm moves through. In the past 24 hours, dozens of dramatic rescues across California. Outside Santa Clarita, this man saved from his vehicle in raging rapids. And in Chatsworth, a 15-foot deep sinkhole swallowing one vehicle, then another falling on top of it. Some 50 firefighters rushing to help, using a rope and a ladder truck to hoist a teenage girl and a woman from the bottom vehicle to safety. Across the state, tens of thousands ordered to evacuate Monday. This creek next to our house never flows, ever. Ellen DeGeneres posting this video from her Montecito home. Residents in the community racing to get out. In San Luis Obispo County, authorities searching for five-year-old Kyle Doan, who was lost after the car he was in with his mother was swept away. There were some nearby uh, neighbors that were able to rescue the mom, but the boy uh, floated off in a different direction. In hard-hit Santa Cruz County, a combination of heavy rain and powerful surf ravaging the coast. Our Matt Rivers is there. This series of storms so powerful it damaged homes like this one along this entire beachfront road here in Aptos. Homeowners taking advantage of a brief lull in the severe weather to try and clean up as best they can. In higher elevations, the epic snowfall shows no sign of letting up. So much snow that Mammoth Mountain had to cease operations for the day. The conditions just too intense. Rob Marciano joins us now from Los Angeles, California. Uh, Rob, time this out for us, if you would. What's coming right behind it as the West really is just not getting a break? 
Yeah, this pattern is really not changing all that much. I don't really see a break for at least another six or seven days, uh, Lindsay. A very powerful jet stream, and these storms are riding in and every 12 to 24 hours in pretty much the same spot. So we're going to look for the flood threat to be ongoing, the potential for seeing more rock and landslides to be ongoing, I think, at least through the weekend into next week. And that means with the saturated ground and some winds coming in more in the way of downed trees and, and power outages will, will be rolling for the entire state of California. Now, the next storm that's coming in comes in tonight. I think this is mostly a northern California. California system, but we'll get some rain down here in SoCal, and so flood watches remain up for uh, much of the valley area. Another five to ten inches of rainfall. This is on top of saturated ground. Another two to six feet of snow on top of an area in the Sierra that's completely buried. And the system that came through this morning here in California, it's launching and zipping over to the east coast. I think it's going to be a severe storms maker for parts of Alabama and Atlanta, Georgia, Thursday afternoon. It is a Pacific system, so it'll be mostly warm rain into uh, the northeast come Thursday into Friday. All the while, the next system next strong system coming in here on Saturday that is set to arrive here Saturday afternoon and that will be yet another very powerful system that will have high impacts into next week Lindsay all right Rob Marciano our thanks to you as always meanwhile in Washington Democratic lawmakers are now officially calling for an ethics investigation into George Santos the newly elected Republican congressman from New York over false claims he's made about his education his work and his religious background Santos insisted today that he's done nothing unethical so how will the new Republican leadership respond ABC's congressional correspondent Rachel Scott is on Capitol Hill Tonight, House Democrats filing an ethics complaint against embattled Republican Congressman George Santos and delivering it to his office. Santos, we have a complaint for you. They're calling for an investigation by the House Ethics Committee, insisting Santos has failed to uphold the integrity expected of members of the House of Representatives. George Santos has lied about just about everything that we know about. Uh, he has zero credibility at this point. Santos has admitted to lying to voters about being a college graduate, about working for Goldman Sachs. Huge swaths of his biography, entirely fiction. You're accused of fabricating almost every single part of your life. Why did you, why did you deserve to represent you in New York? The way. He's now facing new allegations he illegally used campaign funds to cover personal expenses like his rent. Congressman, did you misuse campaign finances? He's cleared the way. Why won't you answer our questions? He's cleared the way. He's cleared the way. He's cleared the way. He's cleared the way. He's cleared the Today, the congressman defiant. I have done nothing or nothing wrong. You don't think you've done anything wrong? I have not. Santos helped Republicans clinch a razor thin majority in the House and backed Kevin McCarthy for Speaker. Speaker McCarthy, will there be any action taken against George Santos? House Republicans today saying the matter is, quote, being handled internally. Yeah, obviously, there were concerns about uh, what we had heard, and so we're going to have to sit down and talk to him about it. Rachel Scott joins us now from the Capitol. Uh, Rachel, House Republicans could, of course, take action against Santos, but are they showing any signs that they might do so? No indication that they will do so, Lindsay. I can tell you that Republicans could move to try to censure Congressman George Santos. They could even decide not to sit him on any committees. But tonight, the reverse is happening. Santos, in fact, is waiting to see which committee he will land on. He says he's not picky and he'll take whatever he can get, Lindsay. All right, Rachel Scott from the Capitol. Thanks so much, Rachel. We're also keeping an eye on the fresh fallout and backlash against the former president of Brazil, Jair Bolsonaro, who remains here in the U.S. as police go on the hunt for the thousands who stormed three of Brazil's seats of power at Supreme Court, Congress, and Presidential Palace after right-wing supporters of the former president claimed the election was stolen. Our Marcus Moore is in Brasilia tonight with a look inside the devastation of one of those buildings. Tonight, prosecutors in Brazil asking a court to seize the assets of far-right former President Jair Bolsonaro as the investigation into Sunday's attack on the Capitol widens. Officials say the money seized from Bolsonaro should help pay for the damage caused when thousands of his supporters stormed all branches of government, many repeating the false claim made by Bolsonaro himself that the October election was stolen. Today, we got a first-hand look at the damage inside Brazil's Supreme Court building. There is just glass everywhere. It's all around. You can see the windows have been smashed. And look on the inside. Absolute destruction. This was a ferocious attack. ABC News confirming investigators have identified more than 100 companies suspected of bankrolling the riots. Today, some of the 1,500 people arrested saying, We will fight again. 
Across the country, thousands of pro-democracy demonstrators taking to the streets, demanding the rioters be brought to justice. Bolsonaro has been staying in this house in Orlando, Florida, for nearly two weeks, but tonight saying he will return to Brazil quickly because of lingering health problems. Marcus Moore joins us now. Marcus, is anyone from Bolsonaro's inner circle also being looked into for possible involvement? Uh, yeah, Lindsay, we learned today that federal police here in Brazil raided the home of a former justice minister for Jair Bolsonaro. There's an arrest warrant out for him right now, and they believe that he is in the United States. Also, a former colonel was arrested and is currently in custody tonight. Lindsay. Marcus Moore from Brasilia, Brazil for us. Thanks so much, Marcus. And the unrest in South America is extending beyond Brazil into neighboring Peru with more than a dozen now declared dead by the country's government amid democratic chaos following clashes at an airport in the southern part of the country. The prime minister called it an organized and systematic attack against police by protesters who were demanding the release of the former president Pedro Castillo. The government has set an overnight curfew in that region starting at 8 p.m. until the early morning. This is just the latest surge of protests since the demonstrations began in early December following the removal and arrest of Castillo shortly after he tried to illegally dissolve Congress. Back here in the U.S., we're learning as many as 100 Ukrainians will begin training as soon as next weekend. That's right here on American soil at Fort Sill in Oklahoma. The U.S. doubling down on its support as Russia gains ground in eastern Ukraine. This is conditions in some areas back in the possession of Ukrainians have deteriorated and scores of children are evacuated. ABC's Matt Gutman is in Ukraine for us tonight. Tonight, for the first time in this war, Ukrainian soldiers will be sent to be trained on American soil. Up to 100 Ukrainians will be sent for training on the Patriot Air Defense missile system starting as soon as next week at Fort Sill, Oklahoma. If I give you the equipment and I give you the training, I now give you a capability. That announcement comes as Russia is poised to make its first gains in months in Ukraine's pulverized east. The grinding fight leaving the town of Solidar in ruins. Tanks firing point blank. Infantry in close combat. The prize? The strategic city of Bakhmut. Russia stepped up its attacks there after Ukraine retook the city of Kherson in the south. The tears of liberation now replaced by ceaseless shelling. Roman Konstenko is a special forces paratrooper and parliamentarian. I mean, there's artillery constantly. Would you say that Kherson is safe for the people? No. No. No, very... Very dangerous. The government urging residents to evacuate, and every day a special train ferries them out. 96 teenagers in this car being sent to safety in Ukraine's west. Was it scary living, being in your village when it was being shelled? Duh. Yes. Yeah. Yes. 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 Nikita's village hit just that morning. Explosions. 10 meters from me, the mine exploded. 10 meters from you, the mine exploded? Yes, it matters. And when I ask, what is it going to be like to go to sleep and not hear boom, boom, boom? They tell me it'll feel normal. Then the hurried goodbyes before the train rolls west to safety. Matt Gutman joins us now. Matt, how long will it take to train Ukrainian forces on the Patriot missile system here in the U.S.? The Pentagon says, Lindsay, it intends to condense about a year's worth of training into just a few months in order to get those Ukrainian trainees back to the battlefield in Ukraine. Now, as for when those Patriot missiles might arrive in Ukraine, the Pentagon did not offer a timetable. They're citing concern that the Russians, if they knew the time and date, might try to actually attack that shipment. But ballpark, they say, hopefully in the next few months. Lindsay. All right, Matt Gutman, thanks so much. A Republican House member has introduced articles of impeachment against Homeland Secretary, uh, Security Secretary Alexander Mayorkas for his department's handling of the border crisis. Republican officials, including new Speaker Kevin McCarthy, have previously called on Mayorkas to resign and have vowed to investigate his actions. A DHS official tells ABC News that the secretary has no plans to resign and that today's impeachment articles have no factual basis. Meanwhile, a Republican House committee is now launching an investigation into President Biden's handling of those classified documents found at the private office that he used before he was president. President Biden is breaking his silence today at a news conference during his summit in Mexico City, calling it a mistake. The FBI and the Justice Department are also investigating. ABC's Mary Bruce is traveling with the president and has the very latest. Late today, President Biden answering questions about the classified documents found at his private office. I was briefed about this discovery and surprised to learn that there were any government records that were taken there 
to that office. Sources tell ABC News Biden's lawyers discovered the approximately 10 classified documents just days before the midterm elections. Some were marked top secret. All are dated between 2013 and 2016. The White House says the lawyers immediately turned those documents over to the National Archives, which then reached out to the Justice Department. Attorney General Merrick Garland tasked U.S. Attorney John Lausch, a Trump appointee, to look into it. Tonight, we're told that investigation is well underway. It comes as a special counsel in the Justice Department investigates why Donald Trump took hundreds of classified documents with him to his residence at Mar-a-Lago, something Biden has criticized. How that could possibly happen, how one, anyone could be that irresponsible. And I thought, what data was in there that may compromise sources and methods? Today, the Republican-led House Oversight Committee launching its own investigation of Biden. I'm not going to be quick to judge. I just know that he said it was very irresponsible for President Trump to take classified document to his personal residence and have them in an unsecured location, and it appears he did the same thing. But there are key differences between these cases. We're told it does not appear Biden personally asked for the roughly 10 classified documents to be moved from the White House. While Trump knowingly took hundreds of classified documents, some with top secret markings when he left office. The White House insists that Biden's legal team immediately informed the archives as soon as they discovered the documents. Trump, on the other hand, refused to hand over the classified material for months, even resisting a subpoena. The FBI ultimately forced to search his Mar-a-Lago home. Mary Bruce joins us now from Mexico City. Mary, President Biden is there meeting with the leaders of Canada and Mexico, but facing those questions about the classified documents, he just addressed this with carefully worded statement. Let's take a listen. I was briefed about this discovery and surprised to learn that there were any government records that were taken there to that office. But I don't know what's in the documents. I've, my lawyers have not suggested I ask what documents they were. I've turned over the boxes. They've turned over the boxes to the archives, and we're cooperating fully. The Justice Department looking at this. Where does it go from here, Mary? Well, the president there stressing that he doesn't even know what information was contained in these classified documents, which he didn't even know were taken from the White House to his private office. And again, stressing that they are fully cooperating with this investigation, which he hopes concludes soon. That investigation we know is ongoing. And one of the big questions here going forward is whether the attorney general will appoint a special counsel to look into this matter as well. Lindsay. And you're, of course, traveling with President Biden following his meetings with the leaders there of Canada and Mexico. Did anything concrete come out of their conversations related to the migrant and, and drug crisis at our southern border? They did make some small incremental announcements, mostly to increase sharing of information when it comes to fentanyl, the production of that horrific drug. But we haven't seen any huge statements coming out about how to stem the flow of immigration, which, of course, was topic number one here at the meeting of these three leaders. Lindsay. All right, Mary Bruce for us from Mexico City. Thanks so much, Mary. Joining us now for more is former assistant U.S. attorney Jeffrey Robbins. Thank you so much for your time tonight. If you were investigating this incident, what would be your number one question to President Biden and his team? Well, I think you can expect that there are going to be subpoenas aplenty uh, issued by the Republican Oversight Committees recently formed uh, aimed at um, the former vice president's office, uh, the those who are running this Penn Biden Center, uh, and ultimately a request from the president himself to answer questions before the committee, akin to the request that was made by the January 6th committee uh, to uh, former President Trump. Is there a scenario that President Biden faces any legal liability for this? No, I don't think there's any uh, realistic uh, likelihood of any kind of criminal charge against him at all. It's pretty clear that what occurred was inadvertent and uh, was uh, promptly disclosed once it was discovered. So there's a strong case to be made that the situation is between former President Trump and President uh, Biden are apples and oranges. But nevertheless, up until uh, 36 hours ago, there were only apples and no oranges. Um, it's a uh, blow to the special counsel, those who want to see uh, the former president 
prosecuted over these documents, and it's a boon to the former president. So it's a complication for the special counsel. There's no question about it. And you use the analogy that it's apples and oranges. Some people are just going to say they're both fruit, and they're not going to really make the distinction. But I, I would like you to specifically say how you feel this situation is different from the classified documents found at Mar-a-Lago. And by the way, you're quite right. The um, this is both. This is all fruit. This is both fruit is going to be the line that is parroted and it's going to be accepted by wide numbers of people. But the differences include the following: um, one uh, w uh, was a inadvertent, apparently, uh, taking of documents uh, and not knowing that they were there. The other was pretty willful, stretched over the course of a year of uh, responding to requests for the return of documents uh, with uh, essentially the middle finger and attended by uh, lying and deception and, and the hiding of documents. Those are very different. One situation involved uh, cooperation, uh, the other involved obstruction. Uh, one clearly involved, uh, in the case of former President Trump, the former president knowing about the situation and making a decision to do what he did with respect to the documents. And the other with respect to uh, current president Biden, so far as we know at least, uh, involved no knowledge on his part at all. You mentioned the word unintentional. You know, some people are going to see, as we were just showing on, on camera, a video of the documents that were in Mar-a-Lago, many of them which had the big red letters that said top secret, right? Or they might say classified or, or confidential, whatever it is. Some people are going to say, how do you take those kinds of papers by mistake? How is this inadvertent or, or unintentional? In the case of the documents at Mar-a-Lago, of course, there were over 300 class sets of classified documents. So that becomes harder to explain than the apparently 10 classified documents. But that isn't to say that both don't involve classified documents, because they do. And to your point, there are going to be those who are going to say, A, how did you take even 10 classified documents out? B, what were they doing apparently among personal papers of the uh, former vice president, the current president? And finally, how is it that they stayed there undetected for six years? And those are, let's face it, legitimate questions. And, and just to put a sharper point on uh, an initial point that you made, uh, President Biden is cooperating with investigators, uh, whereas former President Trump is under investigation for obstruction of justice. How could that ultimately play a factor in, in how these cases are handled? I think that's a huge factor. In the case of the former president, there was uh, active obstruction upon active obstruction upon active obstruction, starting with the uh, uh, the sort of the fiddling around or the dishonesty with uh, respect to requests for their return, the apparent lying about the existence of documents, the evidence apparently that there was a there were hiding of documents. Uh, it is it is a uh, a textbook, it seemingly an obstruction of justice. By contrast, uh, President Biden, by all accounts. Uh, he did not discover them, but his lawyers discovered them, and they immediately, and I mean immediately, notified the authorities. So the difference there is very, very significant, and it's the kind of significant difference that it could indeed play a big role in the determination to proceed with a prosecution of former President uh, Trump. Jeffrey Robbins, always appreciate your time and insight. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lindsay. Investigators are expanding their search for a missing mother in Cohasset, Massachusetts. Police returned today to the home of Brian and Anna Walsh. They drained the pool in the backyard and are testing blood and a bloody knife that they found in the basement. They also searched a waste and recycling facility. Anna Walsh disappeared early New Year's Day, and her husband, Brian Walsh, was arrested on accusations that he lied to police about her disappearance. Investigators say he also spent about $450 on a tarp and cleaning supplies before his wife went missing. A federal agency is discussing the safety of gas stoves. The Consumer Product Safety Commission says there are possible health concerns in response to new research that may link gas stoves to childhood asthma. This would only apply to new products, not for stoves already installed in homes. Natural gas stoves are used in about 40% of American homes. Specialists say that anyone who lives in a home with a gas stove, particularly in small apartments, can take steps to lower the risk, including using a hood vent while cooking or opening windows. 
We're now on day two of a nurses strike here in New York. 7,000 nurses from two major hospitals are on the picket line. One of the hospitals is back at the bargaining table, the other diverting ambulances and postponing elective surgeries. ABC's Eva Pilgrim has the latest. Tonight, 7,000 nurses at two of New York City's biggest hospitals are off the job and on the picket line for the second straight day in a strike over wages and working conditions. They say chronic understaffing made worse since COVID has reached a crisis point and it's putting patients in danger. One nurse to nine or more patients, possibly up to 11 or 12, and it's impossible. We can't do the job we need to do, and it's just not safe. The union wants more nurses hired, fewer patients assigned to each nurse, and a guarantee nurses won't be asked to take on more than they can handle. The days are incredibly overwhelming and stressful. Um, it's really hurtful for us to see what's happening to the patients. Um, we can't, you know, bring them to the bathroom on time. We can't fulfill orders on time. Mount Sinai accuses the union of reckless behavior. Both hospitals are working around the strike by bringing in travel nurses, diverting ambulances, postponing non-emergency surgeries, and transferring vulnerable patients. Eva Pilgrim joins us now. Eva, are, are there any laws or rules that address nursing staffing? So, Lindsay, 16 states have laws or rules addressing nursing staffing, but only California legally defines those ratios in every hospital unit. And it varies with trauma and ICUs having fewer patients per nurse. Lindsay. All right, Eva Pilgrim and from an active scene there. Eva, thank you. When we come back, the new plan that could reduce student loan payments for millions of Americans. A best-selling series is now a new detective thriller. Actor Ramon Rodriguez tells us how he's bringing Will Trent to life on the small screen. First, we bring you a first-hand look into the treacherous journey thousands take every day en route to our southern border. Our Matt Rivers reports on their stories of survival and hope. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're gonna love it. Bring your friends. Bring them all. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. With so much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. But a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning, America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. So, what's good to read? And we mean really good to read right now. Well, that's where Charlie and Kate Gibson can help. Join us for the new podcast series. It is called The Bookcase with Kate and Charlie. We will make sure you love what you read. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Ready for a good show? I'm Phil Grucci. The fireworks by Grucci. No matter how big, no matter how small, it is dangerous. It's not a paycheck. It's our life. 
This is ABC News Live Prime. Hey there, I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. How lucky are we? ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. All new, streaming weeknights. Welcome back. As President Biden wraps up his trip to Mexico for the North American Leaders Summit and touts renewed cooperation on the topic of immigration, the reality is that thousands continue to risk their lives daily, walking through dangerous terrain for a shot at the American dream. ABC's Matt Rivers brings us this report on two men who documented their journeys from Venezuela all the way to Texas. Es sencillamente lo más peligroso que he hecho en mi vida. <risa> el pantano y lodo. Señores, llegamos al abuelo. Daniel Noguera and his daughters, Nathaniel and Danielis, walked eight days through the Darien Gap, the dense forest between Colombia and Panama. It was the first part of a long journey they decided to document step by step on social media. A unique, intimate glimpse into the brutal conditions they and thousands of others face on the trip north. Nos encontramos con un señor que le salvamos la vida prácticamente porque tenía dos días atrapado en lo que es aquí la selva. ¿Cuántos días tenía usted aquí en la selva? Como nueve días. Nueve días aproximadamente, en los cuales dos estuvo atrapado pidiendo asilo y nadie le prestaba el apoyo. Daniel is now living in the United States, and from outside his new home, he vividly told ABC News everything he and his daughters had to endure to make it here. Es una experiencia, verdad, traumática. Hubo momentos en que, oye, la vida de, de mi hija mayor corrió peligro, de que casi se me va por una montaña hacia abajo. Dios mío, yo sentía que me iba a derrumbar. A single dad, Daniel says the ongoing crisis in Venezuela forced him to take drastic decisions. Ya la situación era verdaderamente insostenible. Para comer era muy difícil. Para estar en la calle debido a la delincuencia. Fueron razones aparte de las políticas. Nos llegaban rumores de que nos querían matar, nos querían hacer daño por estar en contra de lo que era... El gobierno. Daniel and his daughters are among the millions of migrants who have made the journey through Central America in 2022. Many of them were forcibly displaced, and just like Daniel, have decided to document their trek. Las historias son aterradoras de gente que muere, pasas y ves los los muertos. Eh, uno que va en el grupo perdió un familiar hace dos días. O sea que esto no es esto no es juego. A former professor and computer engineer major, Lionel Baquero, says he was forced to leave his native Cuba. It took him two entire months to get to the U.S., a journey he decided to share as well on social media. Y yo quería documentar un poco el proceso de lo que pasábamos los inmigrantes para llegar a los Estados Unidos. Porque ya te digo, no es solo mi historia, es la historia de mucha gente. Mucha gente ha hecho la misma travesía que yo hice. La única diferencia es que no ha quedado documentado. Millions have watched Lionel and Danielle's videos at a time of high uncertainty for migrants seeking refuge in the United States. In fiscal year 2022, the number of migrant encounters at the southern border exceeded 2 million, many of them coming from Venezuela, Cuba, Nicaragua, and Haiti. President Biden visiting the border for the first time since he took office and announcing tough restrictions in an effort to stop the growing influx of migrants at the border. My message is this. If you're trying to leave Cuba, Nicaragua, or Haiti, do not just show up at the border. Stay where you are and apply legally from there. Starting today, if you don't apply through the legal process, you will not be eligible for this new parole program. Under this new plan, up to 30,000 migrants a month hailing from those four countries will be allowed to petition for asylum if they meet strict requirements, like having a sponsor in the United States. Those who do not meet the criteria and irregularly cross into the United States will be expelled to Mexico. ¿Qué más no quisiera uno entrar de manera legal? ¿Qué más no quisiera uno, por ejemplo, tener un, aquí un sponsor que te patrocine? O llegar y con un permiso de trabajo ya a la mano de una vez. Ese es el sueño de cualquiera, pero todo el mundo no tenemos el mismo, eh, la misma suerte. Si todos tuviéramos la oportunidad de tener los documentos en regla, créeme que nadie 
se atrevería a, a correr este riesgo y a poner su vida en peligro absolutamente nadie. For so many migrants already here and those still on the way, the whims of immigration policy changes in the U.S. won't matter. They are simply seeking something better in the U.S. Uno opta por tomar el riesgo y asumir, bueno, salir adelante y tratar de conseguir lo mejor para su vida, sobre todo para la vida de, de los hijos de uno, porque uno nunca va a querer que los hijos sufran las necesidades que ha sufrido uno ya. Such compelling stories there are thanks to Matt Rivers for that. Still ahead here on Prime, the sentence handed down for a longtime Trump Organization executive convicted for tax fraud. Some of the biggest superstars on the court are dealing with private battles. Two issues two players are trying to bring to light. And Georgia for the win. We take a look at the college championship victory over Texas Christian University by the numbers. But first, our tweet of the day. Coachella announces its 2023 lineup with the one and only bad Bunny, plus Gorillas, Bjork, Frank Ocean, Calvin Harris, and many, many more. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. This is where I belong. This is home. Real dirt in the sunlight again. I'm very excited. Anything could happen at any moment. My heart is so happy right now. We're making magic. We're making magic. So much at stake in our world right now. We wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. As a journalist, I've learned it's important to grab the reader's attention with a catchy headline. Here's mine. Local woman ruins own life. You are late. Oh. But I told everyone that you were donating blood. Okay, so act kind of woozy. So, what are you going to put me on? The deadbeat. Oh my God, you're putting me on obituaries? Don't you come any closer, I will kill you. I'm already dead. Oh my God, you're my no bitch, Larry. Fun fact, you're the only one that can see me. No! Yep. No! Yep. No! Zoo! 200! Oh, 200! 200 episodes of Dr. Paul. Oh. Music to my ears. It's been 10 years, and I'm still having the fun. That rocks. He's got the moves that make your animals groove. Now we do the dance of joy. Yay! He's like the Justin Bieber of the <laughs> Headlining the hottest barns. Cut out. It's a show you won't want to miss. I'm not going to be here forever. Maybe. <laughs> the Incredible Dr. Pole. New episodes Saturdays at 9 on Net Geo Wild. This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. So, what's good to read? And we mean really good to read right now. Well, that's where Charlie and Kate Gibson can help. Join us for the new podcast series. It is called The Bookcase with Kate and Charlie. We will make sure you love what you read. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Not the most current dance, but I do it really well. The first time I've been in a place that I love doing something that I love. With people that you love? No, I didn't say that. Come on, y'all, make some noise. I'm Turk Janine. Janine. Gregory. Um, Ava. Ava's here. Sorry, I don't speak line. Welcome back, everyone. The Georgia Bulldogs, let's talk about them. They are back-to-back -back college football national champions after their dominating win last night over TCU. Let's take a look by the numbers. With a final score of 65-7, to the Bulldogs scored the most points ever in a bowl championship series or college football playoff title game. The 58-point margin was also the biggest margin of victory ever in any bowl game. Georgia's win marks the first time since the 2011 and 2012 seasons that a team 
has won consecutive titles back when Alabama last pulled off the feet. Georgia also completed their first 15-0 season, and the SEC champs became just the third team in the modern era to cap a perfect season with a national title. Georgia's defense forced three turnovers and shut down TCU's potent offense, which only managed one touchdown. Georgia's offense was led by quarterback Stetson Bennett, who scored six touchdowns, four passing and two rushing, tying the championship game record. The former walk-on quarterback did it all in just three quarters, leaving early in the fourth quarter to a standing ovation from the Georgia faithful. And at 25 years old, Bennett is actually older than five NFL starting quarterbacks who are leading their teams into the playoffs this season. And we still have lots to get to here on Prime tonight. The details from the court appearance of a controversial internet personality accused of human trafficking and rape. And an alternative option on driver's licenses, what you can now mark as your gender in one state. First, look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. much happening these days it's hard to keep up things change hour by hour minute by minute the historic weather that's now unfolding the worries on wall street we're bringing you the right now at a nationwide teacher shortage the right now look at the day ahead an alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest stories world news now and america this morning america's number one early morning news today does feel a little different early mornings on abc news live This is where I belong. This is home. Real dirt in the sunlight again. I'm very excited. Anything could happen at any moment. My heart is so happy right now. We're making magic. We're today. making magic. As a journalist, I've learned it's important to grab the reader's attention with a catchy headline. Here's mine. Local woman ruins own life. You are late. Oh. But I told everyone that you were donating blood. Okay, so act kind of woozy. No? What are you going to put me on? The deadbeat. Oh my God, you're putting me on a bitch. Where is <laughs> Don't you come any closer, I will kill you. I'm already dead. Oh my God, you're putting me on a bitch. Where is <laughs> Fun fact, you're the only one that can see me. No! Yep. No! Yep. No! Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're gonna love it. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real-life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt. True crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Hello, <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Come out, come out, I think my niece Allie was pushed off that ledge. And only one person came into an eight-figure sum as a result of her death. If we pull this off, we're set for life. What do you think you're doing? Get out now. Can this be our little secret? They have to pay for what they did. The Watchful Eye, January 30th on Freeform and stream on Hulu. While the president's student debt forgiveness program faces a Supreme Court challenge, another new program could help cut how much borrowers have to pay. Department of Education Undersecretary James Cabal calls it the first true student loan safety net in this country. The plan would make it so low-income Americans will not have to pay any monthly payment if they make less than the annual equivalent of $15 an hour. For those who have to pay, the plan would cut the amount due monthly from 10% of discretionary income to 5%. It would also also forgive unpaid interest as long as borrowers make monthly payments on the loan itself. 
Kevin Weiselberg, former CFO of the Trump Organization, has been sentenced to five months in jail. He pleaded guilty to orchestrating a 15-year tax fraud, evading almost $2 million in income taxes. Mr. Weiselberg came to court today ready to begin his sentence and he is grateful that it has now begun. And to avoid a long prison sentence, Weisselberg agreed to testify against the Trump Organization. His testimony helped convict Trump's company, but he was careful to say nothing that could incriminate Trump himself. The judge called it offensive. Weisselberg arranged a $6,000 payroll payment from the Trump Organization for his wife, so she could later claim Social Security benefits. Weisselberg was led out of the courtroom in handcuffs. Manhattan DA Alvin Bragg said the sentence shows you have to play by the rules no matter who you are or who you work for. Andrew Tate, the controversial social media personality, has lost an appeal to end his detention in Romania. Tate, his brother Tristan, and two others were arrested last month on charges of rape, human trafficking, and being part of an organized crime group. Their arrest was originally for a period of 24 hours, but was soon extended to 30 days. A court today rejected appeals from the Tates and other suspects to end the detainments. A judge reportedly expressed concerns for the suspects evading investigations and leaving for countries that would not allow for extradition in explaining why their arrests were extended. New York is expanding options for those who identify as non-binary. Government documents will now include the option to mark X for gender rather than male or female. Officials said non-binary people in the state will be allowed to amend records, including birth, marriage, or death certificates, as well as driver's licenses. Information on how New Yorkers can update their records is available on the State Department of Health's website. Two new climate reports released today show that 2022 was a notable year for rising temperatures and costly natural disasters. The European Union's climate change report says last year was the fifth warmest on record and that the planet has gotten warmer every year for the past eight. The report says while CO2 and methane pollution is up, it did not reach last year's record. Meanwhile, a report from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration said 2022 was the third costliest year for natural disasters, with 18 disasters that cost at least a billion dollars. The administration's report also said it expected similar trends in natural disasters in 2023, but that people can be better prepared for extreme weather. The Mega Millions jackpot now beyond just millions. A $1.1 billion prize is on the line now with a cash payout option of more than $568 million. The jackpot has only grown since it was last won in October and currently stands as the third largest in the game's history. But you'll need some luck on your side. The odds of winning, one in 302 million. After experiencing a mini stroke last year, model Haley Bieber is speaking out about her mental health. The 26-year-old revealed that she struggled with a lot of anxiety and fear, worrying that it might happen again. ABC Stephanie Ramos has those details. Haley Bieber is opening up about the mental health issues she now faces following a mini stroke last March. It was definitely the scariest thing I've ever gone through. The supermodel revealing on Vogue's The Run Through podcast that she struggles with post-traumatic stress disorder following that medical scare. I struggled with a lot of anxiety after. I struggled with a little bit of PTSD of just like the fear of maybe it was going to happen again. The 26 year old says she was in Palm Springs when she was first admitted into a hospital for stroke like symptoms. Doctors then finding the cause to be a blood clot in her brain, diagnosing her with a patent for Raymond Ovalley or PFO, a small opening between the top two chambers of the heart present from birth. After having an outpatient procedure, Bieber was discharged. But once she returned to the California hotspot, she says she felt very triggered. Even the first couple times coming back here after was like a little bit of a strange triggering kind of feeling for me because it's like you just remember exactly how everything happened in that moment. The American Heart Association reports that nearly a quarter of individuals who suffer from a stroke may develop PTSD. We do know that after a serious injury or illness, PTSD can be quite common. People oftentimes often uh, will want to avoid situations or reminders of the scary thing that happened to them or uh, the event that caused trauma. Our thanks to Stephanie for that. And now to a greater focus on the mental health of athletes. Two-star basketball players are working to bring awareness on the issue, sharing their experiences and what helped them through those tough times. ABC's Will Reeve has more. 
Back out to Jackson. Paul George and Reggie Jackson of the Los Angeles Clippers are basketball stars, best friends, and advocates for mental health issues. People view us as superheroes and, you know, celebrities or whatnot, but, you know, we, we all fight the same battles. George, a seven-time All-Star and six-time All-NBA player, and Jackson, a 12-year veteran, are using their platform to spark a dialogue and hopefully a positive shift to get more people to open up about their struggles. You two are incredibly close. What sort of discussions do you have about your mental health? A lot of our conversations is truly how are you feeling? Um, what's your thoughts? What are you thinking? It's always just checking in to see, you know, how the person is. Everybody is expected to perform to the highest level. I tend to be in my head on most occasions when I'm having a lot of anxiety. I'm the person that reads the room and, and sit back, you know, and analyze a lot of things and, and it could hurt me at times. I think the more that we can just talk about it, the more that we can make it normal, normalize the situation. And I think people will start to be able to address it themselves. We are um, mind, body, and spirit. So you gotta take care of all aspects and understand that um, without having them all in sync, you really can't move and, and feel well. A recent Gallup poll revealed that only about a third of Americans feel their mental health is excellent and less than half feel it's good, both new lows. But nearly a quarter saw a mental health professional last year. George feels strongly about therapy, influenced by his time isolated from the outside world, playing in the NBA's COVID bubble in 2020. I couldn't sleep. It just was a downward spiral that I was going through. Every moment I felt like I was out there to prove something. I wasn't okay. I was able to get help and figure out uh, a way to cope with it. And what did you find from therapy? How did it help? It was a huge help hearing someone else's perspective of my life. Experts say that African-American males face significantly more mental health challenges and are much less likely to get the help they need. Why do you think that is? Economically, demographically, historically. We already don't have the resources and um, we already feel weaker than probably um, a lot of us are able to speak for. A lot of times we don't even know what we're feeling, but uh, I think that's why the numbers are tilted the way they are. It might be something that someone's really dealing with that don't want to express it because how the world may view it and then that's weighing on them as they're doing their job. Same time just asking for help in life, like whether it be a small task you need help for, um, understand that uh, there's only 24 hours in a day. Nobody can do everything. The brain is the strongest thing in our body. People think it's you work out, you building your muscle. Like, well, you got to do the same thing with your brain. Like, you, you have to take care of your brain. Karen Slaughter's New York Times bestselling series, Will Trent, follows the top detective at the Georgia Bureau of Investigation. Now those words have taken on a new life on the small screen in a brand new ABC series with the same name. Let's take a look. Get in. Somebody was carried out of the house. Oh, an Amber Alert. There's a kidnapping. Homicide and a kidnapping. It's a lot for a Monday. What is he doing here? He's your partner. You know can teach you to see things no one else does. I'm a pretty observant guy. Ladies and gentlemen, actor Ramon Rodriguez is here to discuss his role as special agent Will Trent, who uses his unique point of view and attention to detail to solve cases in Atlanta, Georgia. Oh, Ramon, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, and thank you for saying my name like that. Oh, Ramon. trying, trying. <laughs> so despite having a rough childhood, Will Trent lands on the right side of the law with the Georgia Bureau of Investigation as the top detective who seeks justice on his own terms. Tell us a little bit more about the show and, and your character. Yeah, so, you know, Will is someone that I believe has been an underdog uh, a large part of his life. You know, just as you mentioned, growing up in the foster care system of Atlanta, um, you know, he went through some traumatic childhood experiences. But despite all of that, he's a really resilient, uh, empathetic person who's found a way to navigate through the world and actually use his experiences to solve crime. Um, his perspective and sort of how he looks at crime scenes is very unique. And I think a lot of that is attributed to sort of what he's been forced to deal with in life. What made you decide when you first read this role, I want this? 
I, you know, the character for me, Will, I mean, as I got to just learn more about him and read about him, I think, you know, his resilience, uh, someone that has gone through a lot in life and, and is able to persevere, that was something that I definitely connected with and, and responded to with the character. Um, and, and, you know, the fact that he did go through some stuff, yet he has this bleeding heart. I mean, he cares deeply, and we see that pretty quickly. Uh, one of the first scenes that I read in the pilot that I loved was the scene where he adopts a chihuahua, a dog that he didn't really want, um, but he wasn't going to leave in the shelter. Again, Betty is kind of her, her own underdog, and I think those two can relate and connect on that level. And so his spirit, his heart, um, and the fact that it's, it's complicated. He's a, he's a complicated human being. You talk about his, his compassion, his spirit, his, his bleeding heart. Uh, Karen Slaughter is an executive producer on the series. How much of a role did she play in developing your interpretation of the character? I mean, the great thing is when you do something that's based on a, on a book series like hers is you have this amazing kind of foundation that you can go to. You can tap into the books, which I got to do once uh, I started learning more about the role. Um, I wasn't familiar with her books, so it was fun to kind of dive into them. And she puts it on the page. She lays it out very clearly, this guy's complications, how he navigates the world, the things he's had to deal with and struggle. His, you know, he physically has the scars to prove what he's lived through. And how did Slaughter's books really help you prepare for the role and embody this complicated character? Yeah, they, they you know, they really lay out clearly um, how this guy will sort of navigates through the world, you know, how he's a bit of a loner. He rubs people the wrong way. He doesn't necessarily care what everyone thinks about him. Um, and yet, obviously, it dives into his past and these relationships from his past and how these relationships are affecting him in present days. And, um, you know, my job is hopefully to just try to really authentically step into Will as best as I can, you know, and, and there was a lot of new things for me with that. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a New Yorker, I'm from New York City. Uh, this character's from Georgia, from Atlanta. I had to sort of really dive into that dialect and that sound. Um, and that was a fun process, though. That challenge was actually really exciting for me. So there was a lot of new things about this character that, that I was excited to get into. Yeah, New York to Atlanta, two totally different beasts <laughs> yeah. there. For viewers who haven't heard about the show, know nothing about it, what would you, you think is, is a selling point? I think our show does a really great job of not only, you know, sort of having the heaviness of a drama, but we actually find humor. There's moments of levity. There's moments that I think are going to really make people feel um, uplifted. Um, although some of the cases are going to be heavy and some of the things that we're dealing with are really tough and, and some of these personal characters' childhoods and backgrounds are complicated, but I think it's a fun ride. Um, there's a lot of heart to it, and, and I think there's obviously going to be, you know, the great crime drama cop aspect. Oh, Ramon, we thank you so much. I want our viewers to know you can catch the drama series Will Trent every Tuesday on ABC. And before we go tonight, the image of the day, the president of the United States, Mexico and Canada, all alongside their wives, posing for the cameras as part of the welcome ceremony in Mexico City today, kicking off the 2023 North American Leaders Summit as the three leaders look to find solutions on immigration, drugs, and a lot more. That is our show for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Coming up in the next hour, we're staying on top of a few things, tracking dangerous weather in the West that's leading to devastating floods and rock slides. Why a teacher is being hailed a hero for saving lives after a six-year-old pulled out a handgun and shot her. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. After an extraordinary newsmaking year, thank you for making ABC's This Week America's number one news and politics show on Sunday mornings. You never know what you're going to get on this show. That's all I'm going to tell you. Yes, Whoopi! This mic on? Can you hear me out there? Behind the scenes is always a better show. Absolutely. Always. Absolutely. That's what people don't see during the commercial break. Right. They don't. What happened? I had no idea really what I was getting myself into. That day that we walked out, I, I treasure that day. I just, I couldn't sit there. You're doing good, Joy. You're doing good. Oh, yeah, baby. It 
it was crazy. Behind the Table. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. We're honored. ABC's 2020 winner of three Emmy Awards for Excellence. Thank you for making 2020 Friday night's most watched and most honored news magazine. This is where I belong. This is home. Real dirt in the sunlight again. I'm very excited. Anything could happen at any moment. My heart is so happy right now. We're making magic. We're making magic. Hi there, I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. We're monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour. The suspect who allegedly attacked three NYPD officers on New Year's Eve near Times Square now faces federal terror charges. The complaint said that Trevor Bickford was a jihadish on a jihadist mission when he attacked the officers. He began consuming radical Islamic ideology in the summer of 2022, allied himself with the Taliban and contemplated going overseas before deciding to carry out the attack. Bickford told investigators the attack was not successful because none of the officers died and because he did not achieve martyrdom. The club Q owner Matthew Haynes says that he plans to rebuild the bar following Colorado Springs tragedy. As of right now, the plan to restructure is inside the bar, implement new security precautions and build a memorial to honor the lives lost as well as the lives affected. Haynes says that it's unclear what a memorial would look like or how long a rebuild would take, but the hope is for it to reopen in May. If you're looking at the night skies over the next month and make out any tiny green light in the sky don't panic aliens have not landed a rare green comet is expected to pass by earth this week and will be visible in the night sky for nearly a month according to nasa next tonight to the relentless parade of cyclones pounding the west and beyond. Once again, California is right in the bullseye tonight. Since Christmas, parts of the state have received as much as 36 inches of rain. Tonight, there are additional evacuations, and officials describe the conditions as dangerous and deadly. Rob Marciano will have the track in a moment, but first, he has more on the damage. Tonight, those relentless rains liquefying Southern California hillsides. I heard a big thunderous roar. My dogs went crazy. In the Hollywood Hills, mud and debris inundating this Studio City neighborhood. Families in the area forced to shelter in place. In Central California, highway patrol officers blocking traffic as massive boulders rain down on Highway 168 in Fresno County as the storm moves through. In the past 24 hours, dozens of dramatic rescues across California. Outside Santa Clarita, this man saved from his vehicle in raging rapids. And in Chatsworth, a 15-foot deep sinkhole swallowing one vehicle, then another falling on top of it. Some 50 firefighters rushing to help, using a rope and a ladder truck to hoist a teenage girl and a woman from the bottom vehicle to safety. Across the state, tens of thousands ordered to evacuate Monday. This Ellen DeGeneres posting this video from her Montecito home. Residents in the community racing to get out. In San Luis Obispo County, authorities searching for five-year-old Kyle Doan, who was lost after the car he was in with his mother was swept away. There were some nearby uh, neighbors that were able to rescue the mom, but the boy uh, floated off in a different direction. In hard-hit Santa Cruz County, a combination of heavy rain and powerful surf ravaging the coast. Our Matt Rivers is there. This series of storms so powerful it damaged homes like this one along this entire beachfront road here in Aptos. Homeowners taking advantage of a brief lull in the severe weather to try and clean up as best they can. In higher elevations, the epic snowfall shows no sign of letting up. So much snow that Mammoth Mountain had to cease operations for the day. The conditions just too intense. Rob Marciano joins us now from Los Angeles, California. Uh, Rob, time this out for us, if you would. What's coming right behind it as the West really is just not getting a break? 
Yeah, this pattern is really not changing all that much. I don't really see a break for at least another six or seven days, uh, Lindsay. A very powerful jet stream, and these storms are riding in and every 12 to 24 hours in pretty much the same spot. So we're going to look for the flood threat to be ongoing, the potential for seeing more rock and landslides to be ongoing, I think, at least through the weekend into next week. And that means with the saturated ground and some winds coming in more in the way of downed trees and, and power outages will, will be rolling for the entire state of California. Now, the next storm that's coming in comes in tonight. I think this is mostly a northern California system, but we'll get some rain down here in SoCal. And so flood watches remain up for uh, much of the valley area. Another five to 10 inches of rainfall. This is on top of saturated ground. Another two to six feet of snow on top of an area in the Sierra that's completely buried. And the system that came through this morning here in California, it's launching and zipping over to the East Coast. I think it's going to be a severe storms maker for parts of Alabama and Atlanta, Georgia. Thursday afternoon, it is a Pacific system, so it'll be mostly warm rain into uh, the Northeast come Thursday into Friday. All the while, the next system System, next strong system coming in here on Saturday that is set to arrive here Saturday afternoon and that will be yet another very powerful system that will have high impacts into next week. Lindsay. All right. Rob Marciano, our thanks to you as always. A Republican House committee is now launching an investigation into President Biden's handling of those classified documents found at the private office that he used before he became president. President Biden broke his silence today at a news conference during his summit in Mexico City, calling it a mistake. The FBI and the Justice Department are now investigating. ABC's Mary Bruce is traveling with the president and has the latest. Late today, President Biden answering questions about the classified documents found at his private office. I was briefed about this discovery and surprised to learn that there were any government records that were taken there to that office. Sources tell ABC News Biden's lawyers discovered the approximately 10 classified documents just days before the midterm elections. Some were marked top secret. All are dated between 2013 and 2016. The White House says the lawyers immediately turned those documents over to the National Archives, which then reached out to the Justice Department. Attorney General Merrick Garland tasked U.S. Attorney John Lausch, a Trump appointee, to look into it. Tonight, we're told that investigation is well underway. It comes as a special counsel in the Justice Department investigates why Donald Trump took hundreds of classified documents with him to his residence at Mar-a-Lago, something Biden has criticized. How that could possibly happen, how one, anyone could be that irresponsible. And I thought, what data was in there that may compromise sources and methods? Today, the Republican-led House Oversight Committee launching its own investigation of Biden. I'm not going to be quick to judge. I just know that he said it was very irresponsible for President Trump to take classified document to his personal residence and have them in an unsecured location, and it appears he did the same thing. But there are key differences between these cases. We're told it does not appear Biden personally asked for the roughly 10 classified documents to be moved from the White House. While Trump knowingly took hundreds of classified documents, some with top secret markings when he left office. The White House insists that Biden's legal team immediately informed the archives as soon as they discovered the documents. Trump, on the other hand, refused to hand over the classified material for months, even resisting a subpoena. The FBI ultimately forced to search his Mar-a-Lago home. Mary Bruce joins us now from Mexico City. Mary, President Biden is there meeting with the leaders of Canada and Mexico, but facing those questions about the classified documents, he just addressed this with carefully worded statement. Let's take a listen. I was briefed about this discovery and surprised to learn that there were any government records that were taken there to that office. But I don't know what's in the documents. I've my lawyers have not suggested I ask what documents they were. I've turned over the boxes. They've turned over the boxes to the archives, and we're cooperating fully. The Justice Department looking at this. Where does it go from here, Mary? Well, the president there stressing that he doesn't even know what information was contained in these classified documents, which he didn't even know were taken from the White House to his private office. And again, stressing that they are fully cooperating with this investigation, which he hopes concludes soon. That investigation we know is ongoing. And one of the big questions here going forward is whether the attorney general will appoint a special counsel to look into this matter as well. Lindsay. And you're, of course, traveling with President Biden following his meetings with the leaders there of Canada and Mexico. Did anything concrete come out of their conversations related to the migrant and, and drug crisis at our southern border? 
They did make some small incremental announcements, mostly to increase sharing of information when it comes to fentanyl, the production of that horrific drug. But we haven't seen any huge statements coming out about how to stem the flow of immigration, which, of course, was topic number one here at the meeting of these three leaders. Lindsay. All right, Mary Bruce for us from Mexico City. Thanks so much, Mary. Back here in the U.S., we're learning as many as 100 Ukrainians will begin training as soon as next week, and that's right here on American soil at Fort Sill in Oklahoma. The U.S. is doubling down on its support as Russia gains ground in eastern Ukraine. This is conditions in some areas back in the possession of Ukrainians have deteriorated and scores of children are evacuated. ABC's Matt Gutman is in Ukraine for us tonight. Tonight, for the first time in this war, Ukrainian soldiers will be sent to be trained on American soil. Up to 100 Ukrainians will be sent for training on the Patriot Air Defense missile system starting as soon as next week at Fort Sill, Oklahoma. If I give you the equipment and I give you the training, I now give you a capability. That announcement comes as Russia is poised to make its first gains in months in Ukraine's pulverized east. The grinding fight leaving the town of Solidar in ruins. Tanks firing point blank. Infantry in close combat. The prize? The strategic city of Bakhmut. Russia stepped up its attacks there after Ukraine retook the city of Kherson in the south. The tears of liberation now replaced by ceaseless shelling. Roman Konstenko is a special forces paratrooper and parliamentarian. I mean, there's artillery constantly. Would you say that Kherson is safe for the people? No. No. No, very, very dangerous. The government urging residents to evacuate, and every day a special train ferries them out. 96 teenagers in this car being sent to safety in Ukraine's west. Was it scary living, being in your village when it was being shelled? The, yes. Yeah. Yes. 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 Nikita's village hit just that morning. Explosions. 10 meters from me, the mine exploded. 10 meters from you, the mine exploded? Yes, it may And when I ask, what is it going to be like to go to sleep and not hear boom, boom, boom? Normalna. They tell me it'll feel normal. Then the hurried goodbyes before the train rolls west to safety. Matt Gutman joins us now. Matt, how long will it take to train Ukrainian forces on the Patriot missile system here in the U.S.? The Pentagon says, Lindsay, it intends to condense about a year's worth of training into just a few months in order to get those Ukrainian trainees back to the battlefield in Ukraine. Now, as for when those Patriot missiles might arrive in Ukraine, the Pentagon did not offer a timetable. They're citing concern that the Russians, if they knew the time and date, might try to actually attack that shipment. But ballpark, they say, hopefully in the next few months. Lindsay. All right, Matt Gutman, thanks so much. We're also keeping an eye on the fresh fallout and backlash against the former president, Jair Bolsonaro of Brazil, who remains here in the U.S. As police go on the hunt for the thousands who stormed three of Brazil's seats of power at Supreme Court, Congress, and Presidential Palace after right-wing supporters of the former president claimed the election was stolen. Our Marcus Moore is in Brasilia tonight with a look inside the devastation of one of those buildings. Tonight, prosecutors in Brazil asking a court to seize the assets of far-right former President Jair Bolsonaro as the investigation into Sunday's attack on the Capitol widens. Officials say the money seized from Bolsonaro should help pay for the damage caused when thousands of his supporters stormed all branches of government, many repeating the false claim made by Bolsonaro himself that the October election was stolen. Today, we got a first-hand look at the damage inside Brazil's Supreme Court building. There is just glass everywhere. It's all around. You can see the windows have been smashed. And look on the inside. Absolute destruction. This was a ferocious attack. ABC News confirming investigators have identified more than 100 companies suspected of bankrolling the riots. Today, some of the 1,500 people arrested saying, we will fight again. Across the country, thousands of pro-democracy demonstrators taking to the streets, demanding the rioters be brought to justice. Bolsonaro has been staying in this house in Orlando, Florida, for nearly two weeks, but tonight saying he will return to Brazil quickly because of lingering health problems. Marcus Moore joins us now. Marcus, is anyone from Bolsonaro's inner circle also being looked into for possible involvement? Uh, yeah, Lindsay, we learned today that federal police here in Brazil raided the home of a former justice minister for Jair Bolsonaro. There's an arrest warrant out for him right now, and they believe that he is in the United States. Also, a former colonel was arrested and is currently in custody tonight. Lindsay. Marcus Moore from Brasilia, Brazil for us. Thanks so much, Marcus. 
In Washington, Democratic lawmakers are now officially calling for an ethics investigation into George Santos, the newly elected Republican congressman from New York, over false claims that he's made about his education, his work, and also his religious background. Santos insisted today that he's done nothing unethical. So how will the new Republican leadership respond? ABC's congressional correspondent Rachel Scott is on Capitol Hill. Tonight, House Democrats filing an ethics complaint against embattled Republican Congressman George Santos, hand delivering it to his office. Santos, we have a complaint for you. They're calling for an investigation by the House Ethics Committee, insisting Santos has failed to uphold the integrity expected of members of the House of Representatives. George Santos has lied about just about everything that we know about. Uh, he has zero credibility at this point. Santos has admitted to lying to voters about being a college graduate, about working for Goldman Sachs, huge swaths of his biography, entirely fiction. You're accused of fabricating almost every single part of your life. Why did you, why did you deserve to represent you in New York? The way. He's now facing new allegations he illegally used campaign funds to cover personal expenses like his rent. Congressman, did you misuse campaign finances? Please clear the way. Why would you answer our questions? Congressman, please answer the media soon. When? When is soon? On my time. Today, the congressman defiant. I have done nothing or nothing wrong. You don't think you've done anything wrong? I have not. Santos helped Republicans clinch a razor-thin majority in the House and backed Kevin McCarthy for Speaker. Speaker McCarthy, will there be any action taken against George Santos? House Republicans today saying the matter is, quote, being handled internally. Yeah, obviously there were concerns about uh, what we had heard, and so we're going to have to sit down and talk to him about it. All right, thanks to Rachel Scott. We're now on day two of a nursing strike here in New York. 7,000 nurses from two major hospitals are on the picket line. One of the hospitals is back at the bargaining table, the other diverting ambulances and postponing elective surgeries. ABC's Eva Pilgrim has the latest. <laughs> Tonight, 7,000 nurses at two of New York City's biggest hospitals are off the job and on the picket line for the second straight day in a strike over wages and working conditions. They say chronic understaffing made worse since COVID has reached a crisis point and it's putting patients in danger. One nurse to nine or more patients, possibly up to 11 or 12, and it's impossible. We can't do the job we need to do, and it's just not safe. The union wants more nurses hired, fewer patients assigned to each nurse, and a guarantee nurses won't be asked to take on more than they can handle. The days are incredibly overwhelming and stressful. Um, it's really hurtful for us to see what's happening to the patients. Um, we can't, you know, bring them to the bathroom on time. We can't fulfill orders on time. Mount Sinai accuses the union of reckless behavior. Both hospitals are working around the strike by bringing in travel nurses, diverting ambulances, postponing non-emergency surgeries, and transferring vulnerable patients. Our thanks to uh, Eva for that. New details tonight about the hero teacher who saved lives after a six-year-old student pulled a handgun out and shot her. Police say that the shooting was intentional. ABC's Ariel Reshef has that story. Officials in Virginia piecing together how a six-year-old got his hands on a gun and opened fire in his classroom, severely injuring his teacher. This is an unprecedented situation that we're dealing with. This shooting was not accidental. It was intentional. Police say the first grader took his mother's legally purchased 9mm handgun from home on Friday and fired one round at his 25-year-old teacher, Abigail Zwerner, as she was instructing the class. It's unclear why. The round went through her hand, exited the rear of her hand, and into her upper chest. Despite her wounds, Zwerner managing to clear the other kids out of the classroom. She turned around to make sure that every one of those students was safe. I believe she did save lives. The teacher stumbling into the administrative office where Lawanda Sample Rusk was picking up her grandchildren. She said, call 911. Um, I've been shot. Then she passed out. Those in the office rendering first aid until paramedics arrived. We immediately found um, um, towels and tried to put pressure on her wounds. Mark Anthony Garcia Jr., an eight-year-old second grader, was just down the hall as the harrowing ordeal unfolded. We all went to safe room and then after we got there for a few minutes people started crying police say a school employee restrained the six-year-old shooter until officers arrived finding the gun on the floor 
Our thanks to Ariel. Still to come, lifting restrictions. The change is expected to bring thousands more visitors to Saudi Arabia this year. And the latest fallout for Prince Harry as his revealing new memoir makes a record-breaking debut. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's Bring how you start your, your day, people. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Ready for a good show? I'm Phil Grucci of Fireworks by Grucci. No matter how big, no matter how small, it is dangerous. It's not a paycheck. <laughs> it's our life. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt. True crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Welcome back. We're tracking several headlines around the world. Andrew Tate, the controversial social media personality, has lost an appeal to end his detention in Romania. Tate, his brother Tristan, and two others were arrested last month on charges of rape, human trafficking, and being part of an organized crime group. Their arrest was originally for a period of 24 hours, but was soon extended to 30 days. A court today rejected appeals from the Tates and other suspects to end the detainments. A judge reportedly expressed concerns for the suspects evading investigations and leaving the country that would not allow for extradition in explaining why their arrests were extended. Iran has sentenced three more anti-government protesters to death on charges of waging war on God. A local media outlet reported that Iran hanged two other men over the weekend in its attempts to stamp out demonstrations which have slowed considerably since they began carrying out executions within weeks of arrests. Saudi Arabia will remove COVID-19 restrictions for the 2023 Hajj season and host pre-pandemic number of numbers of pilgrims. The Ministry of Hajj said in a tweet that the kingdom, home to Islam's holiest sites in Mecca and Medina, will impose no restrictions, including age limits. Access was restricted in 2020 to those between the ages of 18 to 65 who have been fully vaccinated against COVID and did not suffer from chronic diseases. Hodge season is expected to begin this June. Prince Harry's memoir, Spare, is now the fastest selling nonfiction book ever. And there's even more fallout over the book's blistering claims about the royal family and the British press. ABC's James Longman has the latest on the controversy. As Prince Harry's new memoir officially hits the shelves, his claims about his family send shockwaves through the monarchy. And he cannot forgive his own family for doing what he sees as a deal with the devil. He claimed his stepmother had sacrificed him to help rehabilitate her image. I ran the whole communications team for the king and the queen consort. Never once did any member of the royal family brief a member of the media with a story or run into the communications team or call us by the phone and say, I'd like you to brief this into the media. I'm not happy with the attention this member of the royal family is getting. The notion is quite simply ridiculous. The press and public reacting to Harry's headline-making claims about his complicated relationship with the Queen Consort, Camilla, which he discussed with Michael Strahan. When your father married Camilla, you wrote, I had complex feelings about gaining a step-parent who I thought had recently sacrificed me on her personal PR altar. Hmm. What has she done at that point, you felt? 
I have a huge amount of compassion for her, you know, um, being the, the third person within my parents' marriage. And she had a reputation or an image to rehabilitate. And whatever conversations happened, whatever deals or trading was, was made right at the beginning, she was led to believe that that would be the best way of doing it. And I can understand why. Harry says he struggled with the onslaught of negative press coverage, but it reached a new level when he started dating his now wife, Megan. In the book, you talk about talking to your therapist. Yeah. And you said you had an addiction to reading about yourself. Mm. Have you fixed that addiction? I have fixed that, that addiction. And actually, the majority of what I was reading wasn't about myself. It was about my wife or my girlfriend mm. at the time because I was... <clears throat> I was literally, I was gobsmacked. And hands up, naive to the, the bigotry and the cronyism within the British tabloids at the time. Um, and it was a real education for me, where it became very personal for me, other than the fact that this was my girlfriend they were writing about, was the realization that the way that they speak about her and the way they treat her is incredibly relatable to everybody else of color. Harry says headlines like these were examples of the racism Meghan faced, writing it was, quote, dog whistle racism and the glaring, vulgar, in-your-face racism. But he made a distinction between unconscious bias and racism in the monarchy. I think the same process that I went through with regarding my own unconscious bias would be hugely beneficial to them. It's not racism, mm -hmm. but unconscious bias, if not confronted, if not learned and grown from, that that can then move into racism. A young British journalist telling ABC News. I think certainly a lot of uh, members of the public that are of colour are perhaps criticising his separation of unconscious bias from racism. Unconscious bias is a serious problem that needs to be tackled, but it doesn't divorce itself from racism and you're not absolved of responsibility just because it arose due to unconscious bias. Our thanks to James Longman. And still to come, a man receives a life-saving gift from a stranger, how it all started with an Uber ride. As a journalist, I've learned it's important to grab the reader's attention with a catchy headline. Here's mine. Local woman ruins own life. You are late. Oh. But I told everyone that you were donating blood. OK, so act kind of woozy. So, what are you going to put me on? The deadbeat. Oh my god, you're putting me on a bitch. Larry. Don't you come any closer, I will kill you. I'm already dead. Oh my god, you're my no bitch, Larry! Fun fact, you're the only one that can see me. No! Yep. No! Yep. No! With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast. Now streaming on ABC News Live. After an extraordinary news-making year, thank you for making ABC's This Week America's number one news and politics show on Sunday mornings. Zoo! 200! Oh, 200! 200 episodes of Dr. Pole. Oh. Music to my ears. It's been 10 years, and I'm still having the fun. That rocks. He's got the moves that make your animals groove. Now we do the dance of joy. Yay. He's like the Justin Bieber of the <laughs> Headlining the hottest barns. Cut out. It's a show you won't want to miss. I'm not going to be here forever. Maybe. <laughs> the Incredible Dr. Pole. New episodes Saturdays at 9 on Nat Geo Wild. Imagine this. Call it a miracle ride. A New Jersey Uber driver was just doing one last job before turning in his car. The passenger, who was a veteran and complete stranger, was on his way to a dialysis appointment. He was in desperate need of a kidney donation. Now, what the Uber driver did next, which you can imagine, was choose to give the gift of life. Our local lowdown tonight comes from our partner station in Philadelphia, WPVI. Take a look. I know miracles have happened in the past. The miracle I'm here. I really <laughs> had those beliefs reinforced. My name is Bill Slumiel. I'm a kidney transplant recipient. About July, my uh, transplant team called me in and said I need to start looking for a kidney. 
instead of waiting for, on that waiting list because of my age. The next day, the vascular center had to send an Uber after me and they had to call an Uber to pick me up. The Uber driver was quite an interesting person. About maybe halfway home, Tim says, God must have put you in my car. When he pulled up in front of my house some 40 minutes later, Tim says, if you'll take my name and number, I'd like to donate a kidney to you. Well, that about floored me. And I was shaking so bad I could hardly write his name and number. I need people that were in a similar situation that I was in to know that there is hope. Whew. If I hadn't shared my story with Tim, I would have never gotten a kidney because he would not have known I needed one. Yeah, giving a kidney is actually a gift of life. And I feel so fortunate to have that gift. Bye. What a ride, what a story, what a blessing. That is our show for tonight. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. Have a great night.